Okay, we're reading Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 3. Now we are actually changing now. We're going into Claudius, the king's chambers. Um, he orders Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to take Hamlet to England. He wants to get rid of Hamlet. Polonius tells Claudius of his plans to spy on Hamlet's conversation with Gertrude. So Gertrude, the queen, has asked Hamlet to come to her room. That's the last thing we saw. And Polonius is going to go spy on that conversation. Uh, left alone, Claudius reveals what actually happened. So let's see uh, what's going on. Let's see what, uh, yeah, let's see what happens. Okay, so this is Act 3, Scene 3 in the King, King Claudius's chamber. I like him not, nor stands it safe with us to let his madness range. Therefore prepare you. I, your commission, will forthwith dispatch, and he to England shall along with you. The terms of our estate may not endure hazard so near as doth hourly grow out of his brows. We will ourselves provide. Most holy and religious fear it is to keep those many, many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. The single and peculiar life is bound with all the strength and armor of the mind to keep itself from noyance. But much more that spirit upon whose wheel depends and rests the lives of many. The cess of majesty dies not alone, but like a gulf doth draw what's near it with it. Or it is a massy wheel fixed on the summit of the highest mount, to whose huge spokes ten thousand lesser things are mortised and adjoined, which, when it falls, each small annexment, petty consequence, attends the boisterous ruin. Never alone did the king sigh, but with a general groan arm you. I pray you to this speedy voyage, for we will fetters put about this fear, which now goes too free-footed. We will haste us. They exit. Polonius my lord, comes in. he's going to his mother's closet. Behind the arras, I'll convey myself to hear the process. I'll warrant she'll tax him home, and as you said, and wisely was it said, tis meet that some more audience than a mother, since nature makes them partial, should o'erhear the speech of vantage. Fare you well, my liege. I'll call upon you ere you go to bed and tell you what I know. Thanks, dear my lord. Okay, listen close. Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon a brother's murder. Pray, can I not, though inclinate? He just said, he said, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it. A brother's murder. Claudius just admitted that he did murder his brother. Nation be as sharp as will. My stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. And like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin and both neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Where to serves mercy but to confront the visage of offense? And what's in prayer but this twofold force to be forestalled ere we come to fall, or pardoned being down? Then I'll look up. My fault is past. But, oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder? That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder, my crown, my own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offense? In the corrupted currents of this world, offense's gilded hand may shove by justice, and off to scene the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But tis not so above. There is no shuffling. There the action lies in his true nature, and we ourselves compelled, even to the teeth and forehead of our faults, to give in evidence. What then? What rests? Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet what can it when one cannot repent? Oh, wretched state. Oh, bosom black as death. 
Oh, lime it, soul that's struggling to be free, art more engaged, help, angels, make a say. Bow stubborn knees, and heart with strings of steel be soft as sinews of the newborn babe. All may be well. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things that Claudius is saying. So he, he's having some problems praying because, well, um, he did a really bad thing and he can't really... Okay, so part of the idea of asking forgiveness for something. So if you ask God to forgive you for a sin, you turn away from the sin, right? So he's having a problem right now because while he could probably ask God to forgive him for killing his brother, taking his kingdom, marrying his wife, well, if he turns away from his sin, he goes the other direction, then would he have to like I'd tell people and like give up the kingdom and give up his wife? I mean, he's had a lot of benefits from this really terrible thing he did. So he can't exactly ask for forgiveness because asking for forgiveness isn't just saying like, oops, sorry. Like that's not actually asking for forgiveness. So he's been struggling with praying. I get that. I feel like if you killed your brother, you took his kingdom, you took his wife. Yeah, maybe, maybe your relationship with your creator isn't a big priority in your life right now. So that eh, makes sense. He can't really pray very well. So he's trying to figure it out. Um, he's, you know, trying to figure out how can he, you know, he doesn't have peace. He doesn't have rest. He's, you know, he's just really struggling. That's so hard. After you've murdered some, somebody, there's guilt. We have this whole idea of like, how do you remove the blood from your hands? You get that in Macbeth too, with Lady Macbeth out, out, damned spot. If you remember that line, she's trying to, to rub the blood from her hands. It's actually not on her hands, but she can't get rid of it no matter what she does. She knows that she's done a terrible sin, a terrible crime. So he's trying to figure out, he's saying, help me angels, oh, how, you know, I need to find a way to pray. So he gets down on his knees. He bows his head. He's like, well, maybe this will work out. And so now he has bowed. He's bent and bowed down to pray at this point. So he's kind of like, I mean, he's, he can't really ask for forgiveness, but he's going to try to, I don't know, bend and bow and maybe he'll feel better. At this point, Hamlet enters and sees all of this. Now might I do it, Pat. Now he is a-praying, and now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven, and so am I revenged. That would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that, I, his sole son, do this same villain send to heaven? Why, this is higher in salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly. Full of bread, with all his crimes broad blown, as flush as may, and how his audit stands, who knows save heaven. But in our circumstance and course of thought, tis heavy with him. And am I then revenged to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? No. Up, sword. And know thou a more horrid hint. So Hamlet walks in on him. He's, he's bent down. He's praying. He's clearly praying. And Hamlet's like, he draws his sword. He's like, I can get him. I can kill him now. Yeah. You know, he's about to go toward him. And then he recognizes, wait a second, wait a second. If I kill him and he's in the act of praying, he's in the act of seeking forgiveness. What if he did? What if God forgave him and then I kill him and he has received absolution? He's the murderer of my father. He does not deserve absolution. He deserves to burn in hell is what Hamlet thinks. So he decides he's not going to kill him right now while he's praying because he doesn't want him to die in absolution. He wants him to die sometime when he's doing something sinful or bad so he can go directly to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Hmm. Nice thoughts from Hamlet. 
when he is drunk asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, a game, a swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it, then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell whereto it goes. My mother stays. This physic but prolongs thy sickly days. Okay, so Hamlet leaves. My words fly up. My thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. So the king, Claudius, even though he's trying to pray, he can't. He can't seem to get the job done when it comes to prayer. Again, probably because of his horribly guilty conscience, he did a bad thing, and there is no way to truly gain forgiveness and change your ways. He's really enjoying all of the terrible things that have come to him because he killed his brother. So his prayers are ineffective. They're just kind of hitting the ceiling and coming right back at him. Oops. And Hamlet decides to not kill his uncle dad. He's going to wait until some time whenever he's sinning. And that way, when he kills him, it will send him to hell and not heaven. He does not deserve to be in heaven, according to Hamlet. Now, for a lot of people, like, people want to, want to make Hamlet this really, like, heroic figure. Listen, it's not that easy. None of it ever is. Whenever we have a tragic hero, you know, there's always some type of a flaw. There's always something that makes it where they really, uh, they're not the, they're not entirely the hero. Man, Hamlet, you have to be careful before you think that everything he's doing is heroic. He's seeking revenge. If he wanted to seek justice or the law, he should tell people in the law who can help him and then Claudius could be tried in some way. Hamlet is not seeking that. Hamlet is seeking revenge. Revenge is not an honorable thing. And I think a lot of times we think of it as kind of a positive thing, like, yeah, eye for an eye, get those people. But that's not actually good. So be cautious with that. So at this point, whenever we see Hamlet genuinely not wanting to send this man to heaven, which is really a decision he shouldn't be able to make for another person, right? That's whenever people start thinking, Hamlet, man, you might be going too far. Hmm. And if you thought he was maybe going too far, just wait till the next scene. Okay.